Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Mid-Tier Thoughts. I'm joined today by a special guest to talk about all kinds of awesome stuff. So uh, we're going to be focusing a lot, too, on uh, water and how to get water in grid-down type situations or issues where water might be compromised. So with that, John, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is uh, John. Uh, I grew up in California, uh, specifically Southern California. Um water there is not very common uh there's just a few springs and some touristy spots other than that uh i uh got into firearms when i was probably 13 started out with bb guns and then graduated to uh firearms when i turned 18 uh then by pretty much built flatbeds for a long time and then uh, as a welder and then I started uh, taking classes to become a commercial diver which most people know better as underwater welders and then after I graduated there I moved to Texas where I primarily dove in water towers and uh, on the side, the Water Towers was the company's main bread and butter, but we also did some stuff offshore and some things at nuclear power plants and sewage plants. Uh, and then I uh, decided that wasn't what I wanted to do, and I moved back to California, and now I've just been working in factories. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually, to be honest, I didn't realize that Water Towers had... Uh, underwater welders, but it makes sense. Uh, <laughs> you know, not like they're going to train it to work on it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I guess with that, I know you and I were kind of talking offline a little bit um, about kind of your background and how you have a lot of knowledge when it comes to areas that are sparse in water or being able to get to water um, and considerations with water when water is, is uh, a necessary thing for life as well as you know in a situation where you know you can't just turn the tap on and now comes water uh it could be you know grid down situation or even in severe droughts and areas things like that so um i know you were saying you had a little bit of knowledge on that aspect and i just kind of want to pick your brain on some of that yeah so uh any questions right off the bat yeah so i mean like so so from from your background i mean obviously like you said you're in california where you know depending on where you're at water can be pretty scarce so for someone in a scenario where, you know, let's say with, whether it's power outage, natural disaster, whatever it is, um, you know, you can look at things like Hurricane Helene that hit through North Carolina, whatever. Uh, what would your, like, what would, you, what would you recommend for people to uh, preemptively do? Is there anything like you would say they should, they should get ahead of time to have in, uh, when that time comes when there's no water? Well, when there's no water, I would say probably if you're in an area that's, has you know dirty water i would say plenty of dirty water like in where the place is affected by hurricane helene i'd probably say the best thing probably be a water filtration system yeah but in places where you can't get to it um so say you know the grid's been down for a while no one's been able to turn their tap water on for a while you've you might have your own supply of water but that's only going to last you so long, you know, and you might go through it faster than you think. Right. So, so uh, well, kind of what I wanted to talk about was, you know, say the water company isn't, you know, fixing, the, you know, getting the water back, back up yeah. and running again. Uh, things you might be able to do to, you know, even save your, your city and, you know, uh, kind of. What's the word I'm looking for? Your your neighbors will be running out of water too. Yes. So they're going to want to help try and figure out how to get more water, or if they're desperate enough, they might just be angry at you for having more than them and taking <laughs> it away. Right. So if you can convince them to help you, you might be able to. Go to your, you know, wherever your water supply is at, 
and you know get the pumps running again. Uh, it there's a there'd be a lot of planning behind that, you know, uh, depending on how far away you are from that water and the uh, tools that you would need. You know, you won't you won't know what kind of tools you you'll need until you know what you know what the situation there is. But uh, I can at least give my knowledge as to how to locate your water supplies, um, how to uh, identify what kind of or what actually is a water supply because some of them some of them do not look like you know a water tower or a water tank. Some of them are oddly disguised. Okay, well let, let's start there. Let's start. Uh, let's start with that. Let's start with um, you know how do we let's start with how do we locate our water supplies? Like, let's say you know you're in the area, you're trying to get the lay of the land, and uh, you know obviously if you see a water tower, you know that's pretty clear. But you were saying that some of these can look pretty disguised. Like what 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 should we be looking for? So what you should be looking for is uh, you know. If you go on Google Earth or, you know, some sort of satellite imagery, you can find mo most of them just by looking for large white circular objects on the map in a residential area. Most likely that will be a water, uh, a water supply. It's uh, those large round white objects are um, like a large round white metal structure just not 30 feet in the air but like yeah more on the ground sometimes they might be ground tanks if you have a water tower that's great mm -hmm. that right. stick, sticks out like a sore thumb right um there's some odd ones uh in the industry we would call them golf balls they, they kind of have a it looks like a golf ball on top of a tee, huh. or a golf okay. tee. Okay. Yeah. Um, norm. Normally, those ones are kind of small, but I mean, it's a water supply. Um, and and you have other ones we called stand pipes. They look like a giant, like a tall silo. Yeah. Um, they'll unlike a silo, they'll, they'll normally have a smooth outer wall it'll normally all be welded uh and in texas we had a lot of hydro pillars those are a little harder to describe they're imagine a water tower with a concrete uh column or column uh a concrete tube going all the way up to to a a white well not it's not always white but a metal water storage tank okay it's almost like a water tower but um if you look up hydro pillar it, it'll and on google and you just look at the images you'll see what i'm talking about uh it almost looks like a funnel on top yeah and uh, and then other other ones uh, that are a lot harder to find are um, they're called clear wells. Now, clear wells are storage tanks that are are pretty much built going into the ground. Okay. Uh, they normally stick up about, above the ground about three to four feet. And then they go down underground about 20 to 30 feet. And those ones are harder to find because most people will not know what they're looking at when they see yeah. it. Or it yeah. might be underneath a building. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like it'd be a little bit more discreet, a little bit more out of the way, hard to find. Yeah. Um, I haven't really run into clear wells a whole lot in, in my time. But we, I would probably run into four or five a year. Okay. Um, and I'd be diving in them every day. Um, oh, deer so feeders. 
Or see, when you're doing these dives, like, what are are you just? Is this just like normal maintenance? Is it like what? Are, what are we? What are we fixing down there? So, so normally we're just doing uh, annual inspections, mm-hmm. and after the annual inspection, we would our company would make a recommendation as to what we saw. You know, maybe it needs to be cleaned a little bit. Maybe it needs new hardware. Um, you know, j- just stuff like that. And then at the sometimes the cust- our customers would say, hey, we want you to clean, clean out the inside or, you know, put a new vent on top, maybe a new hatch, um, ladders, fall protection, stuff like that. Would you say that, like, um, like I guess if you're allowed to say to speak to this, I'm not sure how that works with your clients and everything. Uh, when it comes to like our water infrastructure, from what you've seen, are we are we doing okay, or is it pretty outdated? Like, what are we what are we looking at? So generally, the way it works is it's up to either the, either the state makes a rule that the cities have to follow, or the cities have their own standards. Sometimes, um, sometimes the state will have a general rule and then the cities can add on to it but normally from what i've seen the larger cities will have some sort of a backup system where if the pumps fail they'll have a uh like a backup pump or something and then okay. on top of that, they'll have backup generators. Okay. That's not so, every large city, but. So would you say, I mean, would you say like, you know, on a scale of like one to 10, 10 being fantastic, one being great, like where would you put on a, on a whole, like our, like our water infrastructure? What I mean by that is like, comparatively, when we look at like our electrical grid, like how vulnerable it is, it's, it's pretty, it's ridiculously vulnerable for what it is. Um, you know, when it comes to water infrastructure, would you say that it's, it's similarly, um, easily compromised, you know, potentially with issues, uh, whether it be powder outages or someone up to nefarious schemes, or would you say that the water is pretty secure? I would say it's a good eight out of ten. Okay, that's reassuring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it and it depends on where uh, what your local water department uh, is doing. Okay, so th- and th- those are obviously going to be rules at the city or county level, all the way up to the state level, just depending on where you're at. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, uh, the the pumps they normally run off of the electrical grid. Yeah. I I have very rarely seen them have solar panel panels or uh, anything like that. That would, you know, maintain them long term. Okay. A backup generator would absolutely do the trick, but you know, who's who's refueling that? Right, right. Um, well, I think it's a little bit more reassuring to, to hear that, it, uh, at least from your opinion, that it's a little bit more secure for the water. Um, when it comes to that too, so since we've got these different types of water towers, let's say we've we live in an area we've done a lay of the land we figured out where our water source is from the public sourced water like that um you know what what's our what's our next that let's you know let's say water is becoming harder to procure for whatever reason um how do how do we get water from a to b so let's say okay for before i continue yeah you know where's no no one should i i wouldn't i can't from a legal standpoint, tell anyone that they should go on to uh, water department property because it, it is a federal crime to uh, and enter that well tampering uh, with a water uh, water storage facility is a, a federal crime. Got it. So that being said. Um, I would say your best bet would be to try and get the pumps running again. Whether if you can bring, you know, a generator that might power the pumps or uh, 
something I'd say that would be your best. Now, is that something like your average person's going to be able to do, or is that going to require some like specialized knowledge? It depends on what's not working. Got it. Um, if it's just power, you might be able to get away with a 260 amp um, generator, or sorry, 260 volt generator. Um, sometimes they require more voltage. I would say probably with the smaller counties, you could probably get away with that two, uh, 260 volts. Uh, so let's say, like, for example, you know, EMP hits, powers out. As long as we can get power restored, we should be, in theory, okay. Get the water back pumping again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, one thing I would... Uh, I, I've seen so many different types of power uh, ways water's managed. Uh, I'd say the scariest one for me would be the cities that have their uh, their water supplies completely run by a server. Okay. I, I, I went to one city where they had a bunch of water, groundwater tanks. This is for the whole city, huge city. They And in the middle of all those, they had a building. And in that building, they had servers that were pretty much controlling valves throughout the whole city. Uh, and there, it was also controlling the pumps, you know, keeping an eye on the water level in, in all the tanks, you know, knowing when to turn on each pump and, you know, to refill the tank. Um, so just like everything, all aspects of it completely ran on one server, which I would imagine if hacked, basically gives whoever's in control of it complete control over that area's water. Yeah, and it was just a, the building was, would stop absolutely nothing, uh, nothing EMP-wise. Yeah. And I would um, imagine, I would imagine even on the cyber side that that uh, it's not probably up to as good of a standard as it should be, electronically speaking, so I would imagine that that would probably be a likely target of any kind of a cyber issue if someone really wanted to cause a problem yeah um that i'd say so, th that would probably be an even bigger problem just because with a cyber my main issue with computers my my dad worked at a military base for cyber security mm -hmm. private sector cyber security and one thing he drilled into my head was nothing is unhackable. Right. right. And most things are easier to get into than people realize. Exactly. Uh, it just takes the right knowledge. Um, but I would say at the bare minimum, if – well, let's, let's say something happens, you cannot possibly get the pumps running again electrically you might be able to spin them mechanically if you're able to you know rig up some sort of something to spin the spin the shaft okay um that might be a last ditch effort um okay and then i'd say if all else fails i'd say bring bolt cutters uh a bucket and a rope <laughs> <laughs> and some fall and some climbing gear. <laughs> Do it the old bucket brigade style. <laughs> yeah. Um, the and again, just for safety reasons, uh, I would say uh, don't ever ever get into a water storage tank. Um, they fill them with chlorine, and that chlorine evaporates. And those uh, water towers without a without a f good ventilation system. Ooh, yeah. So uh, you're just choking on chlorine gas there. Yeah, breathing um, that spicy air. Yeah, I. I'll admit I stuck my head inside water towers before and you know took a few whiffs just to get a look <laughs> at, to see what I'm dealing with in there. But you know, one or two. Just a little something to clear the sciences, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a little 
just a little pick me up. Um, if, say, this happens. Sure. Things to have on hand, and if you're a prepared person, in case you happen to have this scenario happen to you. All right. Um, so I've already mentioned a generator. Okay. Uh, some way to regulate the power coming from the generator, just because some some of those pumps might be a little picky. Uh, a 24-inch crescent wrench is always a good thing to have, because you might be using that to break open valves that are stuck and you know just don't want to budge. Uh, a 10-inch crescent wrench, that's just the diving, the diver in me, you know. Our, we were always taught always have a 10 inch crescent because yeah. we're always dealing with uh, fittings and bolts um, lock picks learn how to use lock picks okay because I have the number of times a water company has handed me a handful of keys <laughs> and said that's it they're all there and they you know, you got to, there's one key for the gate. There's another key for the fall, uh, for the uh, intruder protection on the ladder going up the water tower. And then there's another key on the hatch, or to a padlock on the, on the hatch of the water tower. Um, it took me forever to come to the realization that I should learn how to use lockpicks because, again, they'd hand you that handful of keys and Sometimes you'd they'd give you all, all the right ones. Sometimes none of them would work. Other times they say, "Oh, it's all unlocked," and you show up to the place and none of it's unlocked. And it would just save us time. Um, bolt cutters work too. <laughs> the um, but I, I just can't. I have no idea how many times I was sent to the top of a water tower with the wrong keys. And, you know, I'm at the top of the water tower with a radio that's broken. <laughs> and I'm yelling down at them, trying to get their attention. Going, it's the wrong keys! And, you know, there, there's a couple times where it took them all day to realize that they don't have the right keys. Nice. And then... <laughs> Uh, they end up sending me a pair of bolt cutters that are too small for the for the lock. So I break those trying to open it, and then they have to send me another one. Um, I would say also I mentioned a, a rope and bu and buckets for tall water towers. I would say at least four hundred feet of rope. Okay, that's a lot of rope. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for tall one, or well, if you're going to be climbing a ladder, I would say bring a fall harness. Uh, if you want to be smart about it, you can siphon or create a siphon and forget the bu uh, bucket and rope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, you know. I mean, how many probably... how many hundreds of gallons? I mean, how many hundreds of thousands of gallons? You know, are we talking for like the average? I mean, obviously, I would imagine it varies by area, but I mean, you know, how I mean, how big are these are these water towers? I mean, how much water is in here? So, uh, the water towers in large cities they'll normally they'll normally say it's a one or one point five. Some I've seen a one. I, th I think it was a ten million gallon tank. But okay. They normally do it by the millions. If it's yeah, if it if it looks like a uh, if it looks like it has the square footprint of I'd say two McDonald's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say it's a it's at least a million gallons. All right. Yeah. So we get a lot of water. Lots yeah. of buckets. <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh, wasp, wasp spray and duct tape, because wasps love 
water towers. I wouldn't have thought. I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah. Um. There's one instant where I climbed ten, probably ten feet up a water tower, and the fall protection or the intruder protection they have is just a a metal door that they swing over the ladder so you can't grab onto it. And I climbed up, hadn't hooked on, hooked my fall protection on yet, unlocked that door, swung it open, uh, took about two steps up, and I was trying to get my uh, fall protection clipped onto the ladder. And that door came back and swung, hit me in the back of the head. Well, Ooh. that uh, right where it hit me in the head, it also had a, a wasp nest. Oh, nice. So I got stung about six or seven times and you know i didn't realize what was going on at the time and my first instinct was to let go of the ladder yeah so yeah i almost uh i almost had a big boo-boo there luckily i landed on my feet did a nice little roll but i, I was so angry after that i <laughs> i went back to the truck grabbed the wasp spray and went to town on those guys um and i stomped them into the ground after i was done spraying them <laughs> So, um, living in living in California, where you do, uh, and doing what you do for a living, like what do you do personally to prepare for um, like water preparations in, in any type of you know Minuteman scenario? Well, right now, all I can really do is uh, I've got about four uh, packet, you know, of those. Water. Uh, I go to Costco and I buy those uh, things of water bottles. I think it's like forty. Water oh yeah, bottles. the big flats of water bottles. Yeah, uh, I got about four of those stashed away in my basement. And then, I mean, if I go through that, then my eyes are start going. Are going to start looking at that water water supply around here. <laughs> Yeah, I was say um, one of the one of the things we do. Obviously, we have that too. One of the things we do is, um, you know, because when people think about water, they forget a lot of times that it's not just drinking water. You got to have water for other stuff too. And yeah. so, um, every time that we drink a two liter bottle of of soda or you know a thing of apple juice or whatever, any big two liter bottle like that, we usually wash it out real good, fill it full of water, put it down in the back of the basement, and I've got like a. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Like a shelving unit. I've got it full of those and not so much water for drinking, but water for, you know, flushing the toilets, cooking, doing other things, you know, think or, you know, stuff we can purify later, but it's water that's on hand, you know, outside of drinking water. Yeah. Um, that actually reminded me of something. Uh, if you are able to turn on the water supply, it would be, it's really nice. But at the same time, you know people are going to be wasting it. You know people are going to still be trying to water their lawns. They're going to, you know, they're going to be trying to wash their cars. Yeah, I would say I would say that if that's the kind of thing where you're in a scenario where you've had to go turn the water supply back on yourself, it's definitely at that point going to be worth considering some type of rationing system, I would imagine, or some type of you know, hey, let's make sure we're doing this the right way. How that would look, you know, would obviously be up to you and your community and who's all involved. But I would imagine that would be the smart play there is if it's if it's come to the point that you have to manually go do this yourself, it's probably wise to start setting up some type of water ration. Yeah. Um, if you can recognize uh, piping manifolds and understand what everything does, you can absolutely, you know, pump the water into the tank and have the uh, the uh, supply line shut, uh, shut so it would just build up in the tank and normally they will have I mean if you don't want to climb the tank they'll have like a garden hose spigot on the side of the tank mm -hmm. or somewhere near the ground normally that's just for taking uh, samples for testing um However, I've seen some of those where they cracked those open and they can't close them. Jeez. Because, you know, the water 
is normally coming straight from the well. It's not getting any kind of filtration. It's just getting a bunch of chlorine thrown into it, and it goes right into the water tower. Mm-hmm. Um, the sometimes there's it's really acidic, so you know it can rot away some of the. Some I of would the, imagine. I would imagine that would be another concern too with making sure that like if you do get to the point to where you're having to go to your water tower to get water in an emergency situation like that, uh, to keep in mind that you probably are still going to have to filter or sanitize that water. If it's just going straight to the tank when getting dumped with chlorine, I would imagine you'd still need to, it's not necessarily safe for drinking straight out the tap. Uh, it, it would depend on your, on your area. Uh, the chlorine will last a little bit. I'm not sure how long, but I, I've seen so many nasty water towers that I would always filter your water. I would never <laughs> drink it straight from the tap because yeah. you don't know what's in there. Um, and I won't say what town I fe- we discovered this in, but there is a town somewhere in the States that the city was uh, embezzling the maintenance f- uh, fund for the water uh, water supply, and they got caught. They, um, as far as I believe, they're still sitting in prison for it. Yeah, I feel like if there's one thing not to screw with, it's probably the water because that affects you too. <laughs> yeah, so they had neglected it so long that. The chlorine rusted out the screens on the top of the water tower. And normally the, the screens, the reason why they have screens on top of water towers is because if you fill it up full of water and there's no vent or anything and you try and empty it, it'll just crinkle that steel water tower like a like a Coke can. Oh, interesting. Because of, so, of all the pressure? Yeah. yeah. So they'll always have a screen on top of them. And... That screen is normally stainless, but even stainless rusts. Yeah. So the chlorine will make quick work of that. They normally replace it probably once every two years if they're keeping up to date. And then on these specific water towers, those vents had, are the the housing for those vents mm-hmm. completely rusted and fell into the, the tower. <laughs> nice. <And> these, <laughs> And these ones were, they had a staircase going up around, it wasn't a tower, it was a tip ground tank. It had a staircase going up around the side. And uh, we were finding dead birds, cats, dogs, snakes, anything and everything you could imagine in there. Beehives, you know, so much calcium had built up on the walls of this tank and then chipped off and fell to the ground. Oh man. And uh, on top of that, the well they were getting their water from was right next to to volcanic uh, activity. So the water was 98 degrees. You know, if it was any hotter, we wouldn't have been able to work in there. So we're in there and we're just by hand, crunching up all this stuff Ugh. and trying to suck it out with a hose and with a pump and uh so yeah that's why i would say don't tr- don't trust the water coming out of your faucet um always filter it you know reverse osmosis something uh yeah that's uh that's pretty gnarly <laughs> yeah and then in the, some of the other tanks that we were uh, we cleaned. One of them had six feet of sand in it because uh, the the wall of the well, you know, you know, they'll d- drill the well and then they'll stick a big pipe down there. Yeah. To uh, so that pipe had cracked and it sucked in a bunch of sand. And, and it all made it in. Yeah, it all made it in. And then on top of that, normally what they'll use for for oil on the pumps is uh it's just uh 
normally it's Crisco oil from the grocery <laughs> store. And I know that's really funny, but I mean, think if you think about it, it's food grade. Yeah, I would say it makes sense because it's like if I'm going to use something, it'd rather be something you probably ingest anyway rather than like you know WD rather than some kind of like five W thirty mix, you know. <laughs> yeah, but we would sometimes you know the seals on those pumps would would go out and it would shoot that oil in there and they would just be like oh the oil's low and they'll just pour some more of that in there so <laughs> there's been a couple times where we open up a uh, tank and there's you know like two inches of oil flo- floating on the surface of a water tank it's gross but I yeah would- I wouldn't say it's that nearly as bad as, you know, dogs and cats and, yeah, <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Not as bad as dead things. Um, so, you know, if you're doing the whole bucket thing, you know, you might just be scooping out some oil for a little bit, but normally, normally they try and keep that under control. It's normally the towns that are low on maintenance funds that are struggling with that. Um, The, yeah, so please don't, if if you do have to re, or, you know, get the pumps going again, don't use engine oil, please. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Um, Uh, tanks that I worked on where so I was going to mention this earlier yeah. one, of the ty- one of the types of uh, water storage tanks is they're called deer feeders they, most people will recognize them as water towers but you'll see they'll have like the dome for the bottom or the upside down dome for the bottom and they'll have straight walls, and then it'll look like they just stuck a ice cream cone on top. Okay. They'll have kind of a roof that kind of comes off the side. I would say if there's no valve at the bottom, figure out another way. Don't don't climb that thing. <laughs> <laughs> they're norm. They norm. They try to get away from them nowadays, but they still have them. They're extremely old, extremely rickety. Um, they're v- normally you'll get up about forty feet away from the catwalk. That they'll have a catwalk going around the side. Uh, you'll be climbing up the le- the ladder on the leg, and then that ladder will invert, probably about twenty degrees, fifteen twenty degrees, and so you'll almost be climbing upside down to get to the catwalk. Um, unless you're a really good climber, that's kind of a nightmare. And normally there's no cutout in the, in the railing for the catwalk. So once you get up to the catwalk, you have to climb over the railing. Nice. And, and then you'll have to go a little further around the uh, side of it to get to the other ladder to get up on top of it. And that slanted roof is really unforgiving. <laughs> I, yeah, I was. I I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, um, that's wild. So let's. Uh, obviously, you you've listened to the podcast before. Uh, what is your kind of like Minuteman history? So when I was, I was kind of getting into it when I was 17, but I can't own a firearm in California at that age. Right. Um, I, you know, was looking through a few forums online and I came across one and it was, you know, basically find your tribe type of deal. Yeah. And I came across one group that was calling themselves a militia. It was, Five other guys, five other guys other than me. Um, they, 
you know, vetted me a little bit, and then we probably uh, trained together for about a year. And, you know, in that year, people were just kind of getting bogged down by personal issues. You know, one guy had just had his sixth, sixth, sixth child, and so he really didn't have time at all. <laughs> Right, definitely Anymore understandable. To, it, it was yeah. just stuff like that. Yeah. So that group kind of slowly fizzled out. Um, then, and they were more heavily in the mindset of bugging in. Uh, when I moved to Texas, I kind of got into the, a three percenter group. Um. And I kind of quickly got out of that because some of them, they were kind of just taking everybody. Ah, got it. Not really doing a lot of vetting. Yeah, and I I just didn't feel comfortable yeah. uh, around some of those guys. It, I, could, uh, I guess that's all I'll say about that. But um, <laughs> Understood. The latest group that I was a part of... Um, it was here in California. Um, it was the... Uh, they call themselves the California State Militia. Mm -hmm. um, they've got a website and everything. Um, all I had to do to join, join that group was uh, pretty much show up to the first meeting with a uh, with a receipt that says to show that I bought ammo because you have to get a background check to buy ammo. So mm. just have to show the receipt. And uh, then they would give you some forms to fill out, you know, uh, kind of basic information, you know, contact information, stuff like that. And I was kind of... I, I didn't really like that. I, you know, I don't like... You know, this is where you can reach me at this, you know. Yeah, yeah. Here's all my personal information, stranger. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I could tell that the at, at one point this group had a lawyer. Mm. Because some of the paperwork that they had was very, very, you know, it was written. In a very legalese way. Yes. Um, I don't know if they still had one. I do know that they have factions all up and down California. Um, and I've heard of them and seen of them through YouTube and stuff, but you know, not too much, just random videos here and there. Yeah. I, I would say that they're a decent group to be a part of. However, they, when January 6th happened, they were members of that group were being, were getting knocks on their door mm. from the FBI. Right. So, and I kind of didn't want to be a part of that. So right. there was a few other issues I had with the group, such as, you know, when I'm in a group with, like that, where they're just letting anyone that can pass a background check join. Um, you know, I try to avoid talking about things that could be possibly illegal. <laughs> um Right. And at one point, someone that was in charge of our whole region came to one of the FTXs. And, you know, we're back at camp and we're all talking. And he suggested a few things that were highly illegal. Right. And... I, it's like, look, you know, everybody wants to drill the third hole on our AR lowers. Just don't talk about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't and tell I, anybody you did it. <laughs> yeah, and I kept telling him, dude, we can't do that. That's illegal. And he goes, oh, no, it's not. And I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. I've read the specific law <laughs> yeah. word for word. And it's 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 a no-go, dude. And that I, that was the last FTX that I went to. Yeah, I would say I've I've been a part of a couple different groups structured a few different ways, 
And uh, I'd say like that's you basically described just about all the problems that I've seen pop up throughout all of them. I've been in and around groups like that for the better part of a decade. And uh, it seems like you either get groups that are like, hey, if you have a pulse and a rifle, come on in. Right. Yeah. And that invites its own series of problems because you usually don't find out what those problems are until those people have already come out. They've trained with you. You've gotten to know them. They know where you are. They know when you are, you know, they know your routine and now you have to go kick them out, you know? And that's, that's always a sketchy situation. Um, but yeah, you know, there's interpersonal problems, things like that, whatever it may be. Or sometimes you get some dude, you're like, this guy's team is pretty cool. And then you go train a couple of times and you go out for a few beers one night and start talking politics. And you're like, holy shit, this guy's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, get him the fuck out of here. And uh, you don't know that though until that happens. And, you know, then it's like, well, now what do we do? You know? Um, yeah. So, you know, that, or I've been parts of groups where it was like, it's like, dude, I didn't remember dropping off a resume. Are we doing auditions? Like, what the hell? You know, what is this? Did I join the SEALs? And uh, so I've been a part of some, you know, some groups that, like, are way overly structured. And to the point to where it's almost like, dude, you, I don't want to give you all this info. I don't know you, you know? Yeah. And so it's one of those things where you got to find that balance. And uh, I think that that's where, like, smaller groups tend to shine. Is usually like the smaller groups, I'd say even up to like 10 or 12 people. It's usually more smaller knit and people you know. You know, and those I, th I think work a little bit better because of that, because there's a lot more personal trust, you know? Yeah. And they've done a lot of st studies on psychology and everything that about 12 people max is about realistically where cohesion really kind of works as a team. You get much bigger than that, and people start fractioning it off into smaller teams and cliques and stuff like that. So. I think it's a little, it's just tricky to find the right combination of, you know, of we're vetting people and we're doing all the right things and we're not being idiots. Cause that, that would be one thing I know uh, there was one group I was a part of that, um, you know, we'd go out to do our FTXs and stuff and we'd make, you know, like these, I, I'm like, dude, I don't, I don't understand how you can't like just go an entire weekend without getting shit faced. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like we're out here, yeah, we're out here doing our thing, and uh, you know, we made it. We said a thing that where it's like, hey, you know, we're gonna do stuff from you know dawn to dusk, and once night night goes down, you know, we can all chill and relax. But uh, your boy is getting pretty hammered over here, like to the yeah. point that it's pretty unprofessional. It's not like a beer with a steak. He's had like two bottles of Jameson, you know. <laughs> and you're like, uh, homie needs to not be here, and you know, it was things like that where it was like a certain lack of discipline when there needed to be one. And people being okay with it that made me uncomfortable. It's where it's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not cool with that. So I've definitely seen it on both sides. And then I've also been a part of groups where I'm like, dude, you guys are stellar, squared away, rock stars here. But um, you know, it just kind of depends. It takes some time to figure that out. And um, I know, I know you were saying you're in California. How far away from San Diego are you? I'm um, about. It's a probably about seven hours. Oh, okay. I see. I know a guy down in San Diego. I was going to hook you up with, but that seems like it's it'd be a bit of a drag. So yeah, um, it'd be a bit of a drive. Yeah, no, I'm almost dead center between uh, L.A. and uh, San Francisco. Okay. Well, if you if you haven't checked them out yet, you should tap, check out Tap Rack Tyler on YouTube. Um, he's the guy I'm talking about down in San Diego. He's a pretty good dude. Runs a lot of stuff down there, and uh, you check him out. And you'll see what he's about on there. Yeah. To be honest, if I ever join join a group like like that again, it would I prefer it be, you know, guys within a five block radius of me. Oh, absolutely. I I think that just um I don't, I'm not sure how far his circle goes, so he might know a guy who knows a guy kind of thing. Yeah. But I would I would say too what I find tends to work out best for groups like this um, is like well one we started uh, me and me and a couple guys we started calling it a family readiness group because depending on who you're talking to that sounds a lot more friendly than the uh, the uh, the M word yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh, family readiness group usually takes people's guard down a little bit but also. Um, you know, I uh, I think we were talking and you said you were, I think you said you were married at one point. What I like to find is that people who are in a similar situation with me, people who are married with kids, right? 
because one, then we all understand our social lives are going to be a little hectic and we can all kind of get on the same scheduling plan, understanding the need for family time. And two, you have just as much to lose as I do. So your likelihood to do stupid shit to put me in trouble is less, not zero, but less <laughs> and trying to find like those same tempered people, you know, um, cause it sucks when you're the only guy that takes something serious in a room full of clowns. And it sucks when you're the only clown in a room full of people that are taking shit way too serious. Yeah. So, you know, finding those people who are similar minded and similar tempered, but also have just as much to lose as you do, which is incentive for them not to do something stupid. I find is a good way to help with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there, there's, there's definitely, I I know what you mean. When with in one of the, one of the groups, I uh, you know, it was the last day. We were just gonna spend one more night and then head home, and we had two, two people, male and female, and they got drunk, and they ended up blasting some country music. Both of these were people were married to Mm -hmm. other people. (laughs) I can see where this is going. (laughs) And yeah. So that happened in the bed of one of the trucks and, uh, nobody was happy about that because everybody was kept up all night by that music. You know, it's one of these things where like stuff like that to me, it's just, it's, it's just a matter of like of discipline in the sense that where to me, all that tells me is that if even during a time where we know it's a training scenario, we know it's, it's fun, it's training, it's educational. We should take it serious. You can't keep your shit together. Now you expect me to believe that you can do it when like there's, there's actual threats when there's actual risk. You know, yeah. that, that's the part to me that it's just like, that's when you start red flagging people being like, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I mean, you know, say, you know, you're in an actual situation and, you know, behavior like that makes me think, okay, if something happens and we're running out of food or water, are you going to be the asshole that goes and cooks all the, all the food all at once? Yeah. Or are you are you just going to burn through your water and then go bugging everybody else for some? Even simple things like um you know when you think about it just the the I think one thing that's often forgotten is when it, we if you're going out and you're training in these group scenarios, right? At some point in time, if one of these scenarios ever does happen, right? Your families have to be somewhere, right? Yeah. And, you know, kind of like the ultimate dream is, you know, everyone comes together and, you know, li- you know, hides in the castle somewhere, right? The metaphorical castle, all the families are together. Like, well, if you've got problems like, you know, guy A is sleeping with woman C and they're both married to other people, that's going to cause a lot of problems back at camp, right? Yeah. On top of all the other issues you've got going on. And it's little things like that where the biggest thing I think that when I see groups fail is it's not, it's very rarely big stuff, right? Like, oh, this guy is crazy. Um, That stuff happens, but it's very rarely that. And it's more often like petty personal shit that people can't get squared away because someone gets called out and they don't like it. So they, they cause a bitch fit and then interpersonal rivalries fall. And because there's no greater organization holding everybody together, it just kind of crumbles. And unfortunately that kind of stuff, like just like that, it's the kind of thing where it's like, you know, you just got to be so careful with things like that. Yeah. Uh, so tying the, you know, the Minutemen and my speech about water together. Yeah. Uh, so let's say this all happens. You are, you know, everyone wants water. And none is to be had. You, you know, get get your other Minutemen together. And you say, okay, we're going to go uh, check out what's going on with, at, you know, at the water supply or the 
the water tower or the, the pump, the wells. Um, you know, it's a good idea to know where those are now. Just know and maybe drive past them and look because you can plan how to get there multiple different ways in case something happens, you know. Say you need to get a truck up over there and there's a tree in the way. Or, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think that would know, be smart. That's one thing as you've been talking to something that's been running in my back of my head is just like, I know where the visible water towers are because I drive past them all the time, but I was like, I have no idea my county's water plan and maybe I should look that up. You know, I'm sure it's available online somewhere for the yeah. water department and I I should probably check into that. <laughs> yeah, and some of them are very difficult to get to. There's been some where it's a maze of roads to get there. And then there's, I remember specifically one, we were pulling a truck and trailer and there was a really steep hill unpaved just rocks not not like gravel like you know six, six inch wide rocks and i drove up probably halfway and started sliding back down backwards and it got to the point where i kind of slid all the way back down to the, the bottom of this hill that this water tower is on this is the only road going to it and I can't believe nothing broke on the truck or any of the gear broke. Um, but I just got a running start and I just floored it all the way up the hill. And like I could see in my rear view mirrors, like huge rocks were just being shot out from underneath the tires as I was doing this. <laughs> and um, I would say it's it's a uh, you know, making sure that you can actually access it in an emergency would be a big thing. Um, and, you know, going further down the rabbit hole, uh, just keep an, even just keeping an eye on the route to the water tower could be a big deal because, you know, look for things like, you know, is this a good spot where someone might set up an ambush? Right. You know, that's a good or, point, you know, because if, if you're probably not the only person in the world that has the idea of like, hey, the water's out, there's probably water in the tower, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, dri I'd say drive from your house, you know, at a reasonable but slow speed and just look at, you know, be like, oh, I'm just sightseeing or <laughs> uh, and just look around to see. You know, is this is this a sketchy corner? Um, is this, you know, help? Maybe it's a flood that that causes all this problem, and you know, there's a dip in the road where your truck can't make it through. Yeah, how easily uh, accessible is the local water in your area? Yeah. Um, oh, and a lot of these. In the more rural rural areas, some of these towers are out in the sticks, and I can't tell you how many ticks I've found on my clothing and pulled out of my <laughs> out of yeah. myself. So, you know, you know, wildlife and nature might be another thing to think about. Like around where I'm at, we have rattlesnakes. Yeah, that's a good point, too. You know, if, if you're not living in a major town or, you know, in a metropolitan area, um, you know, especially if you're more rural, you know, your water tower, your water source is probably, you know, out over yonder. Whereas, uh, you know, if you're in town, no, it's probably in a different, you know, it's probably more visible to the naked eye. Yeah. Uh, from what I've found in towns, normally, it's uh, the water supply is in a, either next to a school or residential area. I think I saw one right next to a police department. Sometimes it's uh, it's very, very visible. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, you're good. But, 
you know, you get out of town and your water tower might be, or water supply might be two hills over and you can't see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and hell, you may have lucked out and you bought a house right across the street from it. <laughs> That's why you can just keep an eye on it yourself. Yeah. Um, I never thought about this when I was working for that company, but yeah. Uh, and speaking of water, stay hydrated, uh, especially in the summer. The uh, I would climb about seven water towers a day, and I mean full-on towers. Yeah. Um. And when I would do that, I would normally drink about four to six gallons. Um, and that wouldn't just be water. That would be two gallons of Gatorade and uh, four gallons of water. And at the end of the day, I I would not have peed once. You know, it would all just be getting sweated out. And yeah, that'll do it. Uh, you know, you take your clothes off at the end of the day and you're like, damn, my clothes are like five pounds heavier because it's <laughs> yeah. full of salt. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, but that was when we were climbing those water towers in like 115 degree heat. Ugh. So, you know, that was kind of the uh, downside of diving in Texas. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say that. That sounds miserable. Um, and another thing to think about is if you're in the north, further north in the country where it gets down to freezing, if, say, you have a water tower and it's got just got a huge pipe going down to the bottom. That water at the bottom has a tendency to freeze for some reason. Sometimes, normally it won't freeze up at the top. Normally they'll have uh, I can't remember. I, they just call it a mixer. It's just a uh, basically a fan that they just put in the bottom of the water tower and it just circulates the water, prevents it from freezing a little bit. But if the water at the, at the bottom of it stays too stagnant, it'll freeze and potentially burst the pipe. So normally they'll have some sort of like a space heater. <laughs> just like a cheap space heater at the bottom. Just, aimed just to at make it. sure it doesn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if, it's, if something happens when it's freezing uh, and you know the, the water department has given up on on the infrastructure. It might be a good idea just to uh, pop your head in there and make sure that that thing is still... <laughs> just bring a space heater. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, here, here in Southern California, we don't have to deal with that a whole lot. Normally, the worst they say is, oh, it's going to get to 30 degrees tonight. Make sure you put a towel over your faucet, or out of your hose spigots and you know put some blankets over the over your flowers and have a drip <laughs> and it normally that's not even necessary normally the, the heat that you're heating the house with is enough to yeah but you know where you get to the colder areas you know probably yeah. where you're at so yeah i'm up in north idaho it, you, you got to keep the water running in the winter <laughs> Yeah, because um, yeah, otherwise your pipes are gonna burst and then you're screwed. Exactly. Um, well, hey, we're coming up on about a little over an hour. You got any closing thoughts? Uh, once again, do not tamper with uh, the wa uh, water facilities. <laughs> Yes, uh, for legal purposes, no one on this show, me nor him, have ever told you to go do this. This is purely educational. Yeah, purely educational and 
you know, like emergencies only. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'd say keep up hope and you know, stay uh, stay ready. Absolutely, good stuff, man. Well, hey, it was good to have you on. Um, like I said, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, this is still recording, but that's fine because I can edit all this out. It's good to have you on, man. I think you put out some really good information for people as well with, with a lot of the water stuff. And uh, I'll get this edited and up in the next couple of days. And again, thank you for being on here, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no worries. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us with this episode of Mid-Tier Thoughts. We will catch you on the next one.